key of the song. Someone with the level of skill he demonstrates should not be capable of making radio quality hits. Disney released Frozen, so that it would be the top result when searching Disney Frozen, and not anything about Walt Disney's head being cryogenically frozen likely that is, on either count actually. Area 51 is just a front that was allowed to become popular in the public eye, but actually has nothing of value. Not saying aliens in bases exist, just saying Area 51 is allowed to be the popular secret base, thing to cover up actual secrets. I am not downplaying what the airmen at 51 do, just saying that what they do now is not likely as top secret as people are led to believe. That our phones are always recording, at least audio, to target advertising of course, but more secret agent things as well. My mother-in-law talking at dinner about how hard it is to train for a marathon now that she is over the age of 55. I get ads all over Reddit and Google that read, over 50 and a runner? Check out this random product. Within 4 hours of the conversation. I know there was a bunch of stuff about this, but I think every company denied it. Could be wrong though. Marijuana legalization is being pushed by Big Pharma. Once it's legalized, they will then push for restrictive regulations in the interest of public safety that will force shutdowns of consumer or small grow operations, those are only allowed now to foster positive sentiment towards legalization. So then it's legal and they have a monopoly. Planned obsolescence, if it's still a conspiracy theory. Why does my phone suddenly develop unseen issues when the new one is released? It's not a coincidence. And who even asked for these tech companies to release a new phone every year? We live in a time where technology is now growing at a rather slower pace compared to the 2000s when there was rapid innovation. It's not like my current phone is getting crappier in one year, but wait, it is. Applies to phones, tablets, smartwatches, basically most, rather expensive, internet connected devices receiving updates. There's a recent increase in realistic space colonization movies to garner interest in space exploration. Because some people at the top know it's needed. It's actually probably so very wealthy people can get funding and support from us average losers so they can abandon the planet as soon as possible, while we suffer all the crap that was most likely caused by them. People at One of the most eerie and mysterious events in my life happened not too long ago, actually just two years ago when I went to my native village for summer vacation. Since I was little, I had believed that there were invisible forces all around us that sometimes, in some unfathomable way, manifested themselves in our world, and that not all of them could evoke pleasant feelings in us. What I saw one summer evening on a deserted road near the village gave me the right to replace the word, I believe, with the more emphatic, I know. Needless to say, it gave me several sleepless nights and a panic-stricken, irrevocable fear of the native forests. Summer in Yaku village is a special time. While in the city summer is considered a time of rest and fun, in the village's work is in full swing. Haymaking is what occupies the hearts and minds of the residents, forcing them to rise with the first rays of the sun and spend time until late evening on the fertile glades, they are called alas in Yakutia. The northern summer is short-lived, one must have time to cut enough hay for the cattle to make haystacks and bring it to the farmstead. And, soon enough, the autumn is breathing down your neck. At the same time, haymaking is a time of relaxation. If you were born and grew up in the village it is your sacred duty to spend at least a couple of weeks every summer in a lass, breathing in juicy aroma of freshly cut grass, listening to birds chirping and splashing with pleasure in crystal clear lakes. So, after finishing a tedious semester at the university, I got on the bus and drove home without a second thought. For the first week we mowed hay on a river island, enduring the attacks of mosquitoes and gnats that swarmed in the humid air. After the first week, our skin was in such a condition that it no longer swelled up or itched after the bites. 
When we finished our work on the island, we moved to one of the Alice's, about 10 kilometers from the village. We went there in my stepfather's old UAZ, loading all the necessary equipment, scythes, rakes, pitchforks, into the trailer. Making hay in Alas is incomparably easier than on the island, and not only because of relatively small number of insects. The main thing is that there are fewer irregularities of the land, stones and roots in Alice's, which can cause the scythe to break. For a skilled person to work here can seem a sinecure. I can't say that about me, but I confess that I also breathed a sigh of relief when we left the island. Usually, we finished by about 8 o'clock in the evening and returned to the village in the same car. But I soon got into the habit of taking my bicycle, which had been in my possession since my school days, on a cart and rolling home alone, enjoying the evening chill, the ride, and the sense of accomplishment. Especially since it was no more than half an hour away anything is better than jostling around in the stuffy UAZ in the company of my not so talkative stepfather. That evening was no exception. We had put in a few dozen haystacks, which later had to be gathered into one big stack. As the sun began to lean visibly toward the west, my stepdad packed up his gear and left. I think it was half past nine. I stayed in the alas and had a good swim in the little lake that was in the center of the clearing. The mood was excellent, with only the muddy, foot-polluting bottom of the lake marring the experience. It was more pleasant to swim in the river, the current creates a peculiar feeling, and the bottom is clean yellow sand. After leaving the lake, I got dressed and got on my bike. The sun, meanwhile, had taken on a purple-red hue, which in summer usually heralds rains. I pedaled leisurely, the wheel gently scattering the pebbles that lay on the dirt road. There were mostly conifers on both sides of the road, but occasionally I saw birches and larches. The abundance of various tree species obscured the road. Combined with the bright red ball of sun that flashed incessantly between the trunks, the sight was stunningly beautiful and contrasting. The fateful encounter took place with about 4 kilometers into the ride. At this point the forest parted on the right side, revealing another alas with a wooden perimeter fence, the way the owners protect the hay freely near the villages. There was not a soul in the alas now, but on the far side I could see yellow haystacks. There was a thin river running to the left, so there weren't many trees there, either. Ahead was a sharp curve that made it impossible to see who was coming toward me, one of those high crash spots traffic cops talk about. Yakutia's dirt roads and highways are full of so-called bad places, where fantastic things supposedly happen, a grey-haired old woman with a staff chases cars, or a young girl waves down cars, who then suddenly disappears from the car without leaving any trace of her presence. Each such story is usually substantiated by some chilling story from the past that happened near that very spot. The old woman here was hit by a truck, and the girl hanged herself on a limb near the road, about 20 meters from where she stopped the cars, etc. But the road I was driving on had never had a bad reputation. If anyone had ever noticed any unusual phenomena here, the whole village would whisper about it for the next hundred years. So, I guess you could say I was lucky in a way. After admiring the view of the empty alas, illuminated by the red rays of sunset, I turned my gaze to the road and saw a rider on a horse coming out of the turn. The horse was saddleback and was moving forward in a light trot. The rider didn't surprise me in any way, live transport is popular in Yakutia and in many ways more convenient than cars. I confidently steered my bicycle toward the rider. Now, thinking back, I find only one sign that could have alarmed me then, namely, the horse's hooves did not make a characteristic clattering sound when they touched the ground. The horse ran quite silently, but I did not pay attention to this at the time. The animal seemed tired to me, as it ran with a droopy head. The man who towered on the saddle sat upright, not looking around. From a distance I could make out that he was dressed in dark clothes, but then again, I knew that too bright of a coloring in the tones of clothing was not welcome here. For that matter, I myself was in a gray tank top and brown shorts. And so I rode up close enough to sense that there was something wrong with the lone rider, but not yet at the level of intuition, because my brain had not yet fully analyzed the sensory readings. After a couple of moments, I suddenly realized with terrible clarity the first thing, which should not have been there if the rider was an ordinary man. His legs were monstrously long, so long that, despite the considerable height of the horse, they dragged on the ground. The legs did not end in a foot, but simply became thinner and thinner. And thinner until they just disappeared. Those were legs. The second observation that stirred the hairs on the back of my neck was about the horse. Earlier I had seen it from the front and therefore had not noticed anything unusual. As I rode closer, I could see the animal from the side, and another disgusting disproportionality came to my attention, the horse was long. 
as long as its owner's legs. The horse still had four legs, as I remembered, as usual, but his back stretched for meters. I think he would have beaten the length of three normal horses placed one in front of the other. These circumstances alone would have been enough to make me faint with fear, but I had the misfortune not to be content with that, and to look up into the face of the dreaded rider. As soon as I did so, I no longer remember what it was like, I vaguely remember the painful fall and the stinking, burnt rubber-like smell that filled my nose. It must have just gone by without paying attention to me. Anyway, I woke up to find myself lying on the road with my bike, my right shin burning with fire, nothing major, as it turned out, it was just skin peeling, and the road empty again. The bad smell, too, had dissolved, disappeared into the air. The sun shifted a little in the sky, the swoon didn't last long. Its blood red light almost made me vomit. With an army of goose bumps running down my back, I somehow got up and saddled my bike. Riding leisurely was out of the question, I drove as fast as I could glancing back and forth to make sure the long-legged rider wasn't following me. After 15 minutes, which seemed to me like an hour, I entered the village and breathed a sigh of relief. I could hear music playing from stereo speakers in the yards, a chainsaw screeching somewhere, and the hubbub of children. All this calmed me down substantially. I couldn't keep quiet about the incident and told my parents. We agreed that this creature was a so-called passing ghost, who was on his way to other places on his own business. Local campfire folklore gives many examples of such encounters. Such a ghost could not harm me, even theoretically, but it did not help me to regain my peace of mind. I did not, understandably, ride my bike past that alas at the evening again. Even going out to the outdoor restroom at night became a bit of a problem for me. Over time, however, the vivid colors of that encounter began to blur a bit and I hope that I can suppress that fear somehow. But one trait of the fearsome horseman I will never forget. I didn't tell my parents or friends about it, confining myself to the long legs and the deformed horse. It was just too frightening to conjure up again the image of what had sent me fainting and seemed capable of it even now, at night, when I was alone at home, the goggling, paper-cut eyes of the man on the horse that took up most of his face. Yaguts are afraid of dead people. Well, everyone is afraid of them. But according to Yakut beliefs if a dead person in any form, in a dream or in an encounter, appears to living people, especially relatives, then you can be sure that his spirit pulls the soul of a living person to the other world. There are exceptions, of course, for example, if in a dream the recently deceased relative passes on some request like, tell my daughter that 9000 rubles are hidden under her pillow, but usually seeing the dead is not good. This story has something to do with that. There lived in a village an old retired man. His house was big and he had no one. So he decided to rent a room to a trainee who was in at the local hospital. The relationship between the landlord and the girl was smooth. Nobody interfered with anyone. Sometimes in the evenings they chatted about this and that. One winter evening, Tanya was returning from the hospital. As she entered the yard, she heard the crunch of snow somewhere on the opposite side of the yard. The darkness made it impossible to see who it was but she thought it was the old man doing some business. But what surprised her was that the man was panting and moaning very hard, as if suffocating. The girl asked loudly, who is that? And immediately the footsteps and strange breathing subsided. After standing for a while, the girl felt uncomfortable and went into the house. The old man was sitting by the stove, and she realized that there was no way it could have been him. As she quietly stirred, she decided not to say anything, so as not to frighten the old man. They sat down to dinner, and she noticed that the old man looked kind of sad. When she asked him, he said, I went to take a nap after dinner and dreamt about my younger brother, who had been dead for 20 years. He kept calling me to go with him, but I refused. It's bad luck. The girl felt even more spooked, but she kept silent.